Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much indeed for getting here on time. I'm sorry we're a moment or too late. Um, we have uh, to develop some important themes uh, in the next um, hour on renewing partnerships for development, renewing partnerships for development, but also building new partnerships and perhaps revising as well the assumptions that are made on partnerships uh, for development. How can international and regional stakeholders best support Arab economic and social development? These are critical issues when you think about some of the things we've been hearing this morning from the leading speakers uh, up here on the platform. Um, and let's build forward. I've, this is what I've said to all the contributors. Um, the kind of ideas that we've been hearing uh, from this platform, particularly, uh, for example, from Professor Schwab right at the beginning, about the historic new inflection point. That means probably that there have to be historic new approaches to understanding the kind of partnerships that there must be. The fact, as he said, the industry model is changing. That means partnership models have got to change. The assumptions on which partnerships uh, have gone ahead up to now have to change. Moving from employment to micro-entrepreneurship, surely that again affects partnerships. The imperative for innovation and for skills. The move from capitalism to talentism, as, as uh, Professor Schwab put it and particularly addressing uh, the next generation that is uh, impatient uh, and impassioned on this issue for reasons that we all know uh, so well, and the hundreds of millions who feel left out um, in the current uh, realities. I was struck in one of the sessions this morning by uh, Hadi Amar, the Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Middle East for USAID, when he talked about the change in this region having to be indigenous, which raises new questions about what kind of relationship there should be with international partners, however you want those defined. We want to partner, he said, um, with you to find solutions which are homegrown. And His Majesty, talking about the four gates um, for the future, not alternatives, uh, as he put it, they're essential gates. And then under, underscoring the 85 million, the 85 million jobs which are needed soon. And the challenge is for the majority of our populations, which is the under 30s. How to create work, not just growth, but growth which produce, produces work, which produces wealth, which benefits a large number of people. As the foreign minister for um, Qatar put it, the restricted class of citizens, it mustn't just be for them, the growth. And that this has to be done in a model and a framework that respects higher standards of governance and transparency, as we heard from uh, Maurice Levy, with the underpinning issue of speed, speed, speed. That out there, there are large numbers who don't expect it to happen in years. They need it in months. And obviously, there's an important disconnect, which we can address uh, up here. Um, determination, but also uh, nimbleness. I decided to just look back at the um, Arab Development Report for 2002 because it's sobering. Many of us have been to these meetings over the last few years, including several times here, including in the giant marquee which preceded this, uh, this um, excellent conference center. But think of what the Arab Development Report of 2002 was talking about. It was predicting 80 to 100 million unemployed and also this enormous bulge from the next generation, the under 30s. So it's arrived. And I thought I would just reflect with you what Lord Mark Malik Brown, uh, who was uh, the head of uh, UNDP at the time, then went on to become a British Foreign Office Minister and, of course, worked with the Forum uh, for a short time, uh, for a year. He talked about the difficulty of people um, being locked into a serfdom of ideas and politics that have shackled their national life and the difficulty of getting any traction on those warnings of nine years ago, particularly the pushback from the Arab League states as if it wasn't going to happen. Well, now it's happened and the urgency is there. So that's the background, particularly when we know that this has been predicted for a long time, but there is that urgency which has been hastened by the mobile connectivity, the communications and everything which we know about, particularly after the last few months. To underline that this is about the next generation, I'm going to turn to the youngest member of our panel, Yasmin Gale, who comes from um, Egypt, who has allowed me to say she's 24. She is a global shaper. She was in Tahrir Square, but she's very active 
um, in the NGO community in Egypt because I thought she should help frame what the others, the expertise on this platform should be thinking about when it comes to offering new ideas for partnerships, whether existing or different, in the coming months and maybe years. The floor um, is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm very, very honored to be on the panel with uh, so many great people. And uh, it's also a huge responsibility to be speaking on behalf of young people. So I decided to be honest, be myself, and just say what I think. So uh, regarding renewing partnerships, I think there are um, five things that need to be done and need to be done quickly. So the first thing is transparency from both sides. So no hidden agenda on any of the sides, no corruption, good governance, and being objective and honest about uh, our expectations from each other and our vision. Second thing is clarity on objectives on the issues that need to be worked on because uh, in the past, uh, these kind of partnerships were not really relevant to the Middle East because sometimes Western countries would think, okay, now this is the way. Do this way, you're going to be great. And this, is, this seems not to, to be working. So um, collaborative decision-making when it comes to what key issues both uh, the partnership is going to work on. And as you said, Nick, that it needs to be homegrown, so yes, the ideas come from within. That can also use the experience of more developed countries who've had a long uh, shot at democracy and economic prosperity. Uh, the third thing would be a shift from always partnering with the government, always partnering with government institutions, to more of community. Because as we have seen in Egypt and elsewhere in the region, it's the people that have created change. It's the people that have taken matters into their hands and decided what to do. So there, we have millions of community leaders in the Arab world and they need to be uh, recognized and they need to be worked with and I think they can be the best, they can give you the best vibe of how communities are. Uh, the fourth thing is constant follow-up and evaluation so that we make sure that these partnerships really result in something concrete and not just we come to a conference, take some pictures, shake hands and look gorgeous. It's, it's way beyond that. Uh, the last thing would be quickly, do, do all of this quickly because it, this is a very impatient generation. Uh, it's, you might say uh, all these reforms take a long time, but who could have thought that we can topple a regime or a president in 18 days, right? So I think it can happen if there's a will and there's commitment and there's clarity and honesty between both parties. And you're deaf. And your definition of the kind of partnerships that should emerge and where, what you envisage as the new partnerships. Can you rephrase that? What, what kind of new partnerships could you see emerging from this? Um, I see the kind of partnerships are based on equality so that it's a mutual learning partnership. Um, I mean, for example, the UK with the riots and Egypt with the revolution. You could see, for example, the social solidarity aspect was evident in, in Egypt, I think, more than the UK, for example. So it's a mutual learning, but we can learn a lot when it comes to democratization from the UK. I have worked in a project personally that worked with uh, empowering women to be in the parliament, and it was amazing to work with countries that have had a lot of democracy for so long. So I think the kind of partnership would be mutual learning, would be uh, beneficial for both parties, and would, again, as I said, be honest and transparent. Thank you. Prime Minister Salam Fayed, uh, your view of the way partnerships need to develop and the speed at which they can be achieved. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I agree with the thrust of what Ismina had to say in terms of the elements she, she counted. She said she was going to mention five, I think, maybe six or seven, but five. Anyway, but uh, if I were to focus on three of them, uh, she said about accountability first, and transparency, clarity of objectives, follow-up and evaluation. If you take the three together, they all, as a matter of fact, point in the direction of the need for government to be accountable, these three, three elements. And one of the avenues or channels through which that accountability can be exercised and where I believe it needs to be reshaped, taking into account the impatience of the younger generation demand for change, the urgency with which the change agenda should be pursued, 
uh, I believe those partnerships need to be reshaped, uh, consistent with good government having to be open anywhere, open to civil society groups, uh, NGOs, uh, uh, interest groups, uh, not only uh, categorized by age, but different interests, different segments of society, uh, and where, as a matter of fact, partnership can begin to be defined in ways and exercised in ways that ultimately feed into dealing with the need for change quickly, in the sense, for example, of creating jobs quickly to deal with problems of unemployment uh, and all. Uh, let me be concrete, give you an example where, for example, uh, an existing channel of partnering between the private sector uh, and government, where it can be reshaped somewhat in ways that could help the economy become more productive in terms of creating jobs. Uh, if private sector, for example, in this region, I know this happens uh, across the world, but where in this region begins to invest more in higher education uh, in ways that could lead to a training, uh, rehabilitation training agenda that could actually prepare for better labor force, labor force that is better able to assimilate and to actually uh, be responsive and capable of joining the labor force uh, in a competent way, in ways that would suit the needs of those potential employers or employers. Uh, I think all of this is important. I would not stress too much the point about this having to be homegrown in a very narrow sense of the word. I think this is a situation where I think the distin distinction between foreign and domestic may be too thinly drawn, uh, if I may submit. Uh, we live in a highly globalized world today. Uh, So-called Arab Spring would not have happened had it not been so, uh, had the region not become open to change around the world, to how governments around the world govern, as to how citizens uh, live and enjoy citizens' rights throughout the world, I don't think Arab Spring would have, would have happened. So I I'm not too allergic to the notion that key elements of what needs to happen in terms of reshaping partnership, uh, overall governance processes, uh, need for change, uh, methods for change, if at least some of this is, is taken from other cultures and other countries, other experiences. We in the Arab world should be sufficiently self-assured to be accepting of the usefulness of the experiences of others. And particularly that issue of employment versus micro-entrepreneurship, uh, Prime Minister. Can I just press you on that? Because yes. you use the word jobs. Yes. But actually there's a new, there are other ways of em employing people or em yes. they employ themselves. In other words, the new opportunities that are needed which partnerships can help develop. I mean, there have been major changes in uh, economic structures around the world. Uh, first, in more industrialized world, and I remember going back to the late 70s, early 80s, when, in fact, there was this debate raging as to what this new information technology was going to do to jobs in traditional sectors and how destructive it was going to be to employment opportunities in the industrial as well. But look at what happened. Uh, reason for success there was the extent, the degree to which those countries were able to adapt their econom uh, economies, work processes, governance processes to the new reality. Technology and technological change is the main driver. And until you reconstitute and constitute yourself properly to deal with the challenges posed by an ever-changing technological landscape, you're not going to be able to be responsive enough. So I think uh, uh, clearly uh, those changes are taking place uh, here and now. There is a question mark because we do suffer in the region from what I call structural unemployment, not cyclical. You find countries that are growing at five, six, seven, nine percent rates, uh, even in double digits, but you have um, stubbornly high rates of unemployment. That's structural. What that tells you is that there is, generally speaking, a mismatch between skills available and demand for jobs. Uh, things have changed. The economies have become a lot more technologically based and technologically driven. What is it that we're doing in, in institutions of higher learning education? to adapt to this reality. What I'm really suggesting in terms of partnership, and very little of this happens in the region, uh, corporations, businesses spend more on sponsoring events in the region than investing long term in changing the output of the education process at the level of institu uh, institutions of higher education. So I, I think this is important if, in fact, there is that partnership 
Well, I believe that social responsibility, corporate social responsibility, can be adequately and competently and, benefic and, and, and usefully uh, exercised by investing in this way. Uh, that's, that's the way in which you can begin to change the skill mix, if you will, and composition of your labor force. Good. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Um, Madam Albright, the historic inflection point, how are partnerships going to develop and how do they need to develop in this region? Well, thank you, and I'm delighted to be on this panel. I'm actually 50 years older than Yasmin, so I have seen a few changes. Uh, I, ha I have to say that in my lifetime, I have basically seen four huge transition points. Obviously, as a child, at the end of World War II, then the coming into uh, real power of independent movements throughout Africa and parts of Asia, then the breakup of the Soviet Union, and now what we are calling the spring being over at the Arab awakening. And so I do think that one has to look at this within context. I think the issue about youth in all this I find very interesting. I was born in Czechoslovakia. It was the youth that started the Velvet Revolution. The question is how you get from the street uh, to making things happen in countries. And Nick, you spoke about speed. I am all for speed, but the bottom line is we have to be careful not to make mistakes. And the question is how to respond to what I think is a, an opportunity and a challenge to uh, really involve the younger people within the system in a way that really is able to have governance. And so I have, am somebody that has worked in political work my whole life, but I have, there are always people, and especially those that have come out of academics that talk about what comes first, political development or economic development. That's the endless argument. The bottom line is they go together because people want to vote and eat. And therefore, there has to be the creation of the jobs to get what the prime minister uh, was saying. And uh, my question is how we develop institutional structures now that allow for this to happen. Because what I see going on is the institutions that were created throughout most of my lifetime don't work, uh, whether they are at the national level or the international level, and there's very little confidence in them. And the question is how the new institutions are created. And some of it has to do with the points that have already been raised, which is there are an awful lot more people involved in this. The more stakeholders or shareholders or participants due to the new technology. And so the question is how to create the institutional structures for that. And I believe public-private partnerships are actually a very good way, where we marry what governments can do with what private corporations can do, non-governmental organizations can do, educational institutions can do. Yasmin, you're talking about community-level based thing. It is going to require full cooperation by societies where we can, in fact, mobilize the power of technology rather than being afraid of the power of technology. At the moment, I think when we were in the back room, Nick, you held up your iPhone and basically said, that's what is running us these days. The truth is, as somebody that used to be in the government, you can't respond every two minutes to what is happening out there because the first information is usually wrong. And so the question is how you manage not to be the victim of technology, but to be the master of the technology. And the young people are the best at making it work, understand it better than somebody my age, but the bottom line is they need to be part of a system and feel empowered by it and not left out by it. Is there a danger, Madam Albright, of defaulting to the idea of new institutions or radically uh, reformed and rejuvenated institutions? Could that in its own way delay everything? Should there be something which is much more nimble, particularly when there's the imperative of, you quoted it back, I was quoting others from this morning, this imperative of speed because of the expectations from uh, Yasmin's um, Well, generation. you don't have time to reform all the institutions. I spent a large portion of my life looking at how to reform the Security Council of the UN. It's the Rubik's Cube. You can spend your entire time trying to figure it out. The bottom line is you have to figure out how to make the, how to either create new institutions, uh, 
Minister Balladur is going to talk about the G8. I think the question is how the G8 morphs into the G20, how you basically use institutional structures to become more nimble to deal with the issues. All right. I will come to Prime Minister Balladur in just one moment, if I may, uh, Prime Minister. But can I just go to Mukhtar Kent and ask you for your reflection? We've heard uh, Madam Albright talk about institutions, at least um, moving towards that. What's your view from the corporate sector? Um, the, the question is, you know, how does uh, international and regional stakeholders improve the uh, current uh, conditions, economic conditions, uh, social conditions uh, in this region? I think, how do we spur it, how do we create the level playing ground for more investment, more job creation, and more empowerment? I think that is the real question. And, and there's, there's always a very direct link between investment and jobs. And there's a finite amount of capital in the world. And so there has to be naturally old models have to be complemented with the new model of collaboration, uh, collaborating between government, business, and civil society. Companies, small, medium, large, have to spur investment, have to be risk-taking, and have to believe in the future. In my case, my company is going to invest five billion in the next 10 years in the region, 20 countries. It was only two billion in the last 20 years. So increased investment. But also, companies have a responsibility. Again, indigenous solutions. Companies have a responsibility to help also at the same time, simultaneously now on the ground, help create sustainable communities by working with academia, by working with NGOs. Um, through this collaborative process. A case in, in hand is just like the partnership for a new beginning, um, which is again this, this golden triangle of trying to spur entrepreneurial exchange between the United States and countries in the region. We're launching the Jordan um, uh, chapter of, of partnership for a new beginning later this evening. And, and there has to be also a change we can't expect everything, all the policymakers, to change overnight. Yes, they have to generate creative incentives to attract more capital. But also, local, there's a great role here for local policymakers. The world today is no longer an amalgamation of 200 and some countries, it's an amalgamation of 100 cities where 50% of the GDP in the world rests, a hundred and a hundred cities. So cities in the region and mayors, governors province, of provinces need to compete, need to act like, more like business people. And they have to uh, cooperate with the youth on how to attract investment, how to create partnerships, and how to generate an entrepreneurial exchange and entrepreneurial spirit within their towns, within their villages, within their cities. And that is, I think, really important. And if you take um, this, this whole concept and then you've got to inject, I think, really compression into it because we can't wait for the playing field to be perfect. There will be some mistakes along the way, hopefully small ones, but the youth, particularly you talked about, has very high expectations. So we're all faced, governments, businesses, civil society, the entire youth population, at this moment are all faced with, a, with great tailwinds of where we're looking into the future, but also with headwinds about what is happening, what is being, some of the changes that we have just talked about, and they're great changes, are creating some short-term challenges. How do we face those short-term challenges and ensure that the expectations of the youth are at least partially met in the short term? Do you believe there are existing models for nimbleness and speed which can be used now to adapt and produce results in the, at the kind of speed that is necessary? Well, I, I, I think we, when, five years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, Every project that I looked at um, of, of any significance, small, medium-sized or large in Europe, 
had something to do with the EBRD, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, who were providing very creative solutions to help entrepreneurial uh, companies come uh, from all the way from the Baltic Sea down to the Adriatic. I think we need one, two, or maybe even more uh, creative uh, regional development banks in the region, working with investors, creating technoparks, ensuring innovation thinking starts ha to happen. And the, we all have to believe one thing. Innovation today in the world, unlike 15 years ago, does not only come from the Western world. Innovation comes from all over the world. And everyone in this region needs to believe that they can innovate and they can produce something that is of value not only to their own country but to their own world. And technoparks have to be uh, funded through creative methods. Incentives have to be given for investments in the region much more than they are. And if you look at the whole region, you mentioned 80 million jobs that need to be created. We have to create a middle class in each of these countries in order for democracy to flourish and to be sustainable. And you can't do that only by employing people. You need entrepreneurial spirit to really take off. And that is what we need more than ever before. Small and medium-sized enterprises are the backbone of every economy that is producing benefits to their people. I should just uh, inject into this, I don't know if Eric Bergloff is sitting in the audience somewhere, but the European Bank, of course, does have a mandate now to move into this area and has begun scoping in Egypt, and I gather there's going to be a meeting on Monday in Cairo. So they're already moving down that track in a limited form, and presumably it'll be uh, Libya and other countries after that. Edouard Balladur, um, let me come to you next. Uh, Madeleine Albright reminded us of the institution of the G8. Of course, in, the G8 doesn't want to call itself necessarily an institution uh, like the G20, but can you report to us now the ambitions of the uh, Supporting Arab Countries initiative coming from the last G8 meeting? Très <coughs> volontiers. Willingly. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nick. The, today I'm speaking as uh, special envoy of the Deauville Partnership. Now, the Deauville Partnership is an initiative taken by a certain number of countries and institutions, more about that in a moment, to allow the Arab Spring to lead not just to political progress and emancipation, but also leading to economic and social progress. That's the fundamental objective. Now, um, who makes up this partnership? And we'll see the demonstration here of uh, uh, what Madame Albright said. That is the complication of international life. In this Deauville partnership, you have the G8 countries, the five Arab states in transition, including Jordan. There are four Gulf states. There's a whole series of international organizations, IMF, EBRD, World Bank, uh, UN Arab League, and then there are regional organizations, in particular the Arab funds, which shows you the complexity of the matter. Now, what is, what is the objective? Well, it's on the one hand a political component, reform, society, develop relations within civil society, uh, modernize uh, the legal structure, create a law-based state in certain countries, and then there's an economic component. And I've uh, traveled to Gulf states, and uh, I've been on a number of other trips, and it would appear that we can indeed, for those five countries, that we can count on assistance of the order of 70 to 80 billion dollars, which is a considerable uh, sum, but it does pose a few problems, and if I may, I'd like to just um, say a word about the problems that it poses. The first thing is that one mustn't disappoint. A hope has uh, been born. Countries that are developing and that are experiencing spring uh, want this spring to be successful, and were we to fail and not deliver on the aspirations of the youth that uh, Yasmin was referring to earlier, it would be a huge disappointment and a major political and economic risk. What must be done to uh, succeed? <coughs> Allow me to submit to your attention uh, four or five ideas. The first, we must ensure of the 
the duration. These, these numbers mustn't be short-lived uh, just uh, for flattering annou announcements so that the leaders can uh, derive benefit from the figures that they are mentioning with no follow-up. To be successful, by the end of uh, November, after the uh, Deauville partnership and the, uh, and the end of the G8 meeting, that we should confirm two things. Firstly, the figure of 70 to 80 billion of uh, various uh, provenance of, of, of grants, of pledges, of budgetary promises, that we should confirm that. And secondly, that we should uh, plan that that will indeed last. And I have to say that I'm very encouraged by uh, the, the statement made by Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, because the U.S. will be assuming the presidency of the G8 as of next year once uh, France's term ends. She's indicated that uh, she believed, she was convinced that the United States would add in favor of uh, continuing this Deauville partnership. So first condition, duration. Secondly, all this is, is rather complicated. International life, if I quote once again Madam Albright, but she's so right that I can't resist the pleasure of quoting her, is as complicated as national life. That's really specific to modern society. When you want to solve a problem, you don't really know here to turn to because there are so many competent people. I therefore propose that every year there should be a specific meeting of the Deauville partnership with all the players that I've cited to review, to take stock of the situation, the 70 billion for a three-year period, 2011, 2012, 2013, have they been uh, paid up? Have they been spent? Is that enough? Have they been um, used up? Are there new uh, requirements? And who knows? Uh, we started with four countries, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, and Jordan. Libya is now the fifth country. The case of Libya is rather special one. It's not short of financial resources, but it must be authorized to, to use them, and that uh, shouldn't pose a problem. So second question, every year to meet and to assess the state of progress. Third problem, it's so complicated that the need for coordination is paramount. We need to know who does what, are there uh, certain aims or certain objectives that certain organizations uh, pursue, whereas uh, others uh, fall by the wayside. We must make sure that everything is properly addressed. So I'd imagined setting up a sort of a permanent secretariat for this Deauville partnership that would have managed uh, the uh, cases and ensure the transition from presidency to presidency on an annual basis. <clears throat> I noted there was a good deal of reluctance in the people I've spoken to who feared that they would be uh, rather uh, too uh, framed and followed up. So I uh, obtained the agreement of the Tunisian Prime Minister three days ago and the King of Jordan earlier this morning so that each country should take the initiative to host uh, in its own country several times a year all these uh, stakeholders, international organizations, EU, etc., to review progress in the country of the situation in the country where in Jordan we know that Jordan has two or three major projects that can profit the population as a whole. What's the state of progress? Is it working well? That's the third. Fourth point. <coughs> I don't know if everyone will agree with me on this, but let me say that I'm not in favor of placing con political conditionality in these matters. We mustn't give the people sense that they're placed under uh, stewardship, as it were. We must uh, trust them. It must be a relationship based on trust established with developing countries. Now, those are the few thoughts that I wish to uh, submit to your attention and the proposals that I will be uh, setting out at the uh, G8, which I hope uh, will be um, endorsed. It's a, it's a difficult uh, uh, matter, but very important. And if we were to, to fail, well, <clears throat> of course, uh, the youth would uh, be very disappointed, and we have a sense that we really haven't done what we should have done.
Merci bien. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Could we have the lights up, please? I'd like to get mobilize the microphones. Uh, and while the mo microphones are being mobilized, who would like to, to come in to talk about partnerships? Um, can I see any hands going up? We'll think about it. One here, please. Get the microphone there. But before we go there, while the microphone's on the move, Yasmin, what do you think of the ideas that we've heard? Do they begin to address your sense of urgency and need? Actually, I have a question. Uh, because I'm quite skeptical about the, in, the G8 initiative. Because if we take a look at the previous reports uh, on the region, like Egypt, for example, in the World Bank or IMF, you'd find that they're actually kind of doing a good job. And there's GTP growth, but the people are not feeling it. The youth are not feeling it. This could be due to unequal distribution of resources. So my question would be, how can we ensure that social justice is maintained under this initiative. You're talking about conditionality here. Yes, and yes. <laughs> Prime Minister Balladur, quickly, even though you're still pushing this forward, but uh, a, gen a very um, significant question here, a profound question really, about whether, whether there will be some kind of conditionality. Oui. Well, I, I, re, I was referring. I was referring to political. Uh, I was referring to political conditionality. To be clear, I don't know. In answer to your question, I don't know if the G8 is qualified to say to a country it's providing assistance. Uh, there's not enough of a justice system in your country. Whether we're qualified to say that? Let's be careful. The border, the dividing line between the assistance that we provide with. Uh, goodwill and the sort of strings attached with it, that's a very tenuous dividing line. We must also respect people's freedom. Um, of course, you say that uh, progress uh, was achieved for Egypt thanks to the IMF, and you're right to point that out. It's, it's truth, or to the World Bank. But uh, we're bound to note here that uh, income inequality remains uh, huge, considerable in Egypt. Now, can we define a condition for providing aid, for providing assistance, as long as it leads to an improvement in social justice. Who's going to define such a rule? I don't feel I'm capable of defining that. I think you've asked a very difficult question. First of all, in terms of how any international pledging takes place, um, the question is whether the countries live up to what it is that they've pledged. That's number one. Number two is who does the money go to? And in many cases, it's government to government. So then the question is, what is the government and does the government have any uh, sense of responsibility? What we heard in one of the panels earlier, Egypt was actually a pretty rich country. That was not the issue. And so the question is, how does it really get to the people? And that is why I think there needs to be more and more work at the local levels and trying to figure out who is, act, is truly in contact with the people that need it. And that's many of the reasons why we've been arguing for public-private partnerships and a, a way of understanding who all your, in any country, who the local organizations are. The other problem that I have found is that often um, the Prime Minister was talking about trying to get some kind of coordination what happens sometimes is some organization gets all the money and some other organization gets none of it. And so there are these areas where we need to figure out what is better. One of the arguments about aid has always been, do you give a, fishing, a fish or a fishing rod? The new statement is you have to change the fishing industry. I mean, bottom line, it has to be done differently. Should we be talking about aid, do you believe, all of you? Should we be talking about aid or something which is different as a partnership? Madam Albright, you've just raised it. I, I do think it has to be different. It can't be just giving things. There has to be the buy-in about wanting to create something that is local, that does do what Mukhtar was saying, is kind of take advantage of innovation, entrepreneurship, risk-taking, a series of other aspects. Prime Minister Fayyad. It should be about aid, but only to an extent. Because the minute you begin to talk about aid, it presumes that but for depth of resources, the region would be better off. That's just not true, as a matter of fact. The region is awash with liquidity as a whole. It's a question of distribution. And the reason distribution is not doing the, the job it's supposed to do is because you do not have a, an investment a environment that is conducive investors to come in and do what they would like to do. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, you look at countries individually, you will find that, as a matter of fact, the banking system, more often than not, in each of these countries is setting large heap of resources that are not being invested domestically. Reason, uh, inadequacy of the legal framework, uh, inadequacy of um, uh, the overall uh, uh, environment when it comes to the way investors would like to see it. Uh, so therefore, uh, I believe you know, there is an issue, there's something to be said about conditionality, not in the sense of excluding it from consideration completely or including it to the point where you basically begin to micromanage countries. This is a different kind of setting. This is a different kind of setting in the sense that this whole G8 initiative is taking place against the backdrop of countries that are undergoing change, change that they would want to manage for the benefit of their own people. So there is a presumption of commitment to change. Uh, I think there are key elements, uh, for sure. If what I'm saying about aid makes sense, or is to make sense, uh, that is definitely to be expected of each country to fix its legal system, to ensure predictability of contracts, to ensure adequacy of rule of law. Unless you have those things, then you, you cannot sustain development. Mukta Kent. For sure. I think, I think just very quickly, I, I haven't seen any country in the world create a sustainable middle class of any number with aid, and therefore it, aid can only be a Band-Aid. Uh, it, we shouldn't generalize. It's obviously a very diverse region, all, all the way from Morocco. I just raised the question about whether aid was the correct word to now be yeah. using about new partnerships. And I would say no. I think it has to be one where you have the people, you create a con conditions where the people believe that there is a better future and they're willing to take risk and invest and create uh, a, a m m industrial activity that really generate. A, a, a much better uh, place for the youth to be having a future than they have today. And I think that really is the key now. You, how you stimulate that, you can use very many different methods, aids, uh, government to government, um, uh, low, in, uh, incent, uh, low interest rate um, uh, support, all of those can be mechanisms. Thank you. We've got 50 minutes to run, so who's got the microphone there? Let's keep the question short yeah. and the answer short. Um, hello, this is more commentary if you allow Could me. Can you tell us who you are? Yeah, my name is Jacob Colster. I'm representing the African Development Bank. My president would have been on the panel. He Indeed. been here today. I think he would have said something along the following lines. You basically have a situation where there are three areas where new partnerships need to be established. The first one, Ms. Galal mentioned, and this is the new compact partnership between people and their governments. It seems to me any additional partnership in the region, in the world, to assist, help this region will be ineffectual unless that compact gets it right. And I think you, you pointed out the elements that need to come into place and that can be put into place very quickly. It's really not difficult. You don't need new institutions to establish a new compact between those who rule and those who are governed. The second partnership I believe that is not in place today is the regional partnership. It is, it is clear it is a region where there are the haves and the have-nots. It is one of the richest regions in part, uh, which a net capital exporter that is not benefiting the countries today that really needs that. And the third partnership is the one that Mr. Balladur talked about, which is the international partnership around G8, where, by the way, the African Development Bank is actually taking the lead to coordinate that. And there, I think, that partnership, with all the commitments that we have put on the table collectively, will only be effective if the first, if the first partnership becomes effective, the new compact between people and their governments. Thank you. Thank you. There's a lady in front who would like the microphone, so maybe just move it forward, please. Hi, my name no, is... No, no, one moment, sorry. one moment. I'm oh, coming here first. I'm Mohamed Jafar from Kuwait. And my question is to Mr. Kent and relates to the 85 million jobs that uh, need to be found. Is it the corporates that are going to provide these jobs, the governments, or is it going to be entrepreneurship? Is there going to be a push towards allowing small enterprises, two or three people, to be self-employed? Um, and what mechanisms are going to take the economies from where they are today to um, you know, uh, an environment 
where small entrepreneurs can flourish. Can I just, Mukta, just uh, focus that a little more sharply and say partnerships to develop those jobs, as we've just heard in that question, for development, just to keep it very much on that specific focus? Well, the f first answer is I think it's going to be a combination, not one. It's going to be a combination all, of all. Large corporations, it's going to be partnership, it's going to be smaller entrepreneurial uh, uh, businesses that come into being. How, but one thing is really certain that has to happen. Today, in the region, private business has a much lower share of the total GDP than any other region in the world. And that has to change. That has to change without having short-term negative impacts. Because if you, if you shake up a system and don't think of the consequences of the consequences, then you'll actually go back. And actually, right now, where we stand, from a foreign investment point of view, the region has suffered because of the changes. Generally speaking, foreign investment kind of generally suddenly puts the brakes on when they see things like what has happened as to what is going to be the next chapter. So what we have to do is really move through this period really quickly and at the same time, local indigenous solutions, local solutions that city, city governments, policymakers at national level has to stimulate private investment from inside because we heard the region has a lot of capital. It's just not being channeled in the right direction because of many rigidities in the system. Thank you. You've got the microphone. Um, hi, my name is Zuhal Sultan. I'm from Iraq and I'm representing the Global Changemakers. Um, it's sort of a question comment to Mr. Kent. Uh, you mentioned the great uh, creative regional development banks, which is a great thing, and you compared it to Europe. But do we have the capacity to use these regional development banks? Think about it. Are the youth of today empowered enough to have the mindset to go about and make the, um, and have a small project? And if they do, if some of them do have some projects, are these projects aimed at sustaining uh, the development of the uh, economics in the region? Are these projects uh, going to help us in terms of, uh, for instance, sustainable energy that we're going to need in the future since oil will run out eventually? I think the only way that you could do that is at the same time as creating these banks, creating these institutions, flexible institutions, you at the same time create multiple technoparks with that, with that triangle of collaboration between business, government, and NGOs and civil societies and educational establishments. Platforms where students, doesn't have to be even entrepreneurs yet, prospective entrepreneurs can go in and talk to others about their ideas in these technoparks outside of cities and let the governments of these cities give land, uh, sp uh, give incentives to these, for these technoparks to flourish. And then the capital, the funding, different funds, make, many different funds will come. And I'll tell you about from a perspective of big business. Today, we no longer want to create every single innovation inside of our four walls. We create them in these technoparks. We support these technoparks. We call it the incubation model. And we need one in each, not one, one in, in the outs, outskirts of each city where there's a university. Technoparks. Well, let, let me ask about the practicalities, uh, Prime Minister. Uh, Technoparks, building on what that question was about how you relate investment to the ability to create jobs, demand, work, new ideas, little in, enterprises of two or three people, where you come from um, uh, uh, and the challenges particularly that you face at the moment. All of these are fa uh, relevant factors and considerations, but I was struck most by what Zuha said about sustainability, uh, sustainable development. How can you sustain this even if you're successful at launching it? Uh, I believe the, the bridge lies in, in coming up with an initiative, and that's where the aid component comes into play as a channel for partnership. Uh, aid comes into play where there is inadequacy of the infrastructure in one or more of these countries, for example, where governments, given their own limited resources, cannot finance infrastructural projects. Now, large infrastructural projects do two things, if you actually were to implement them. Number one, they create jobs. So 
by doing so, you are able to begin the process of job creation quickly. But then importantly, and this takes me to the point of sustainability, importantly, what that does too is to improve the competitiveness of the economy. Because if you are to have sustainable economic development, the only way you can have it is if, in fact, you're competitive in this highly globalized world and economy. And this requires that you have a, a infrastructure in the region of the kind that does not exist in any one of these countries or does not exist adequately. So there is a component for partnership here that deals with aid, and that's okay and justified, provided that it is done and extended in a context that does not perpetuate dependence on aid, which requires some framework of conditionality. Call it political, call it economic, doesn't have to be micromanagement, but it has to be done in the right policy framework. And do you believe a technopark principle yes. Yes. is something which can get real traction in your sure. country? And by the way, uh, absolutely. Uh, this is something we are working on, taking advantage along the way of the public-private partnership of the kind that Madeleine Albright uh, talked about. Uh, and I think this is critical. This is where I believe you can create uh, channels and bridges cooperation between governments and the private sector where there definitely is mutual interest in, in doing so, and, and uh, those kinds of parts can be very helpful. Thank you. Component yeah. of sustainable development. Thank you. Uh, at the back there, and can you get the microphone over here, please? Over here. Thank you. Right at the back. Thanks. Uh, Mohammed Abu Shakra from Egypt, um, Young Shaper. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, we are talking about, here about um, sustainable development strategies, and in these countries that are just emerging from the uprising or still in uprising, they all have an interim government that doesn't have any long-term vision. So the first question is that on what basis, on what legitimacy uh, um, the international community could talk about uh, a sustainable partnership with an interim government? This is first. The second question is, aren't we yet done from um, a government, government or international uh, development and government relationship? Isn't it the time that the person who will decide that we need a certain kind of partnership is the people. I didn't see, for instance, any talks about the G20 results or even uh, the, the, the kind of deals that was going on between the IMF and, uh, and, the, and the government of Egypt in Twitter. And when the government said we will not get fund from, or a loan from IMF, we all, all Twitter were celebrating. However, I knew that a new NIC were in the annual meetings. It was the first time that the IMF gives like a kind of sustainable and good deal with the government. And the people didn't know anything about that. In other words, is the matrix of these partnerships, are you looking at it in rather a traditional way at the moment? Madeleine Albright. Well, I, I think that the answer is yes and no. I mean, there is an attempt to try to get money from here to there. It's very hard to say you're not going to deal with interim governments because part of it has to do, uh, we were talking about speed and are people going to get involved and there are the questions about how the political story catches up with the development story. If we're looking at the various calendars that we have for elections in various countries, for instance, Libya has a whole program that it has to set out, but it's going to take several months to go through step to step, have a new constitution, who does what. And in the meantime, some of the people are eager for change. So we have to be flexible in the way we do this. The other part is that there will continue to be um, transfers through the international institutions. I think the issues about the regional development banks is very important. On the other hand, I do think that we're looking at creative ways. <clears throat> Uh, the Prime Minister was very kind to mention uh, the Partners for a New Beginning, but we've been involved in something else together, which is a combination of the Aspen Institute and OPIC in terms of creating, uh, giving uh, money with a cooperation of the Palestinian Authority to small and medium-sized enterprises. And that's an invention that we just kind of was ad hoc. We came up with, I think, so, uh, you know, you can talk about it works. And some of the question is how you are creative enough to use the, the larger institutions and then have the credibility to use the smaller is ones. Is ad hocism the way forward? Then? It can't be the only way to go. I mean, we can't operate the world through ad hocism, but we do have to figure out a way to be flexible. And I think we are in the period of the biggest change that many of us have ever seen, and we're testing. We are testing. And the problem will be, and another panel, the accountability. Because um, the 
there is a shortness of attention span to problems. Uh, and people get discouraged if there are not some results. All right, we've got two or three more minutes, but I can see two uh, at the back there who'd like to intervene. So let's get those remarks first. Senate Human Rights Watch, uh, a question for Prime Minister Fayad and Ms. Albright in particular. Do you think it's appropriate for the U.S. government to have conditioned aid to the Palestinian Authority, in fact, withheld aid from the Palestinian Authority as punishment for submitting a bid for statehood to the United Nations? All right. And can I just move the microphone across to Barbara Judge as well, who I think was behind you there. Um, if you can just make your point, Barbara, Im immediately, and then... Barbara Judge, um, Chairman Emeritus of the UK Atomic Energy Authority. The question of partnerships needs a partner on both sides. And the question I have is, do we think that the region and the particular governments that are there now, or may be there now, will be able to be responsible enough to the people to put in place the, the environment that we need for partnerships of government, trans governance, transparency, education. Is there a partner that's stable enough and accountable enough to do that? Thank you. A, a point of principle, a question of principle at the end there, but can you first of all, Prime Minister, just answer that question uh, from Human Rights Watch? Yeah, um, there's a great deal that the Palestinian Authority did uh, to benefit from large sums of money uh, extended by the United States to Palestinian Authority to the tune of $3.5 billion since inception of Palestinian Authority until now. There's hardly any sphere of activity that did not benefit from that, whether we talk of school, clinics, uh, roads, infrastructure, what have you. There's no question uh, that the development effort would be uh, impaired uh, and would undergo difficulty if that aid were to be uh, cut off, as a matter of fact, from the point of view of sustainability, uh, the prospect of cutting off aid is almost equally as damaging because it tells uh, investors get scared. I hope it will be possible to actually lift the hold that currently uh, uh, is placed on uh, aid to Palestinian Authority. Having said this, uh, uh, I think it, is an, it would be an extreme oversimplification to say or to think that uh, foreign aid uh, is conceived in, in a context that is apolitical. Aid that is of humanitarian uh, slash emergency nature tends not to be conditioned on anything. But economic aid is. And countries, donor countries, give aid in the context of a policy framework that they think is in their best interest. Ultimately, it's their call. We hope it will be reversed. But the ultimate answer lies, as far as we Palestinians are concerned, is to redouble our effort aimed at attaining financial viability, and we can do that. That last question as well about the principles in this time of transition. Madeleine Albright, uh, uh, Mr. Balladour. Oh, je voudrais dire simplement... Well, I... So could we... I would just like to say that to ask whether we should uh, provide aid or not to interim governance is not really is not really the right question because these governments are all in a new democratic process and that in those conditions for some governments uh, elections are going to take place over several months and not to assist them in such a difficult period is running the risk that elections do not um, give uh, good results I mean I'm going to Egypt. Somebody said to me, uh, why are you going to Egypt? The elections will last for months simply because there are immediate needs to make budgetary ed ends meet for the Egyptian government. And if we can assist them, it's better than not helping them. That's the first answer I'd like to make. Secondly, regarding aid or assistance debate, we must look at things realistically. I mean, there are countries who need aid because they have no resources. Call it what you will, aid or assistance. We must um, give them a helping hand, and I say this all the more willingly. It has nothing shameful. After all, Western Europe benefited from uh, uh, U.S. aid as part of the Marshall Plan for over 10 years, and no one felt humiliated because the Americans were helping the Europeans who'd been uh, destroyed uh, by war. So 
let's look at things squarely. If there are countries that don't have sufficient resources, and there are some in the Arab world, we know who they are. We don't need to name them. We know they can only subsist thanks to aid that is provided to them. Let's be realistic. Let's provide them with that aid. Let's encourage them to make the best possible use, but let's not lock them into rather ideological, preconceived ideas. Time is almost upon us. Um, let me just ask you, what's your reflection? Do you think we're going to be raising exactly the same question with the same level of urgency next year, or do you feel optimist? Um, I hope we don't. I'm more of optimistic, actually, because the region is really changing, and this raises a lot of opportunity. But I just want to make a comment that aid has done more harm than good, in my opinion. It, it has made our countries very dependent on it. And the time has changed, the reality has changed, and if we encourage communal initiatives and homegrown ideas, I think it's uh, social entrepreneurship, young entrepreneurs to be in power, I think this is a way better um, way than aid. And um, I think that we also need to redefine other concepts more than partnership, like foreign direct investment, for example, uh, that technology has to be transferred, young people have to be trained, and instead of wasting more time talking about the skill gap, focus on intense on-job training, which will ha help the region a lot. And um, the last thing I would like to say is I would love to see governments, our new governments, creating a more enabling environment rather than us expecting it to be the provider of everything. The last thing that I would like to remind you of is that people in different squares around the region were calling for bread, social justice, and dignity, and freedom, of course. So I hope you remember that, and by next year we have accomplished some of these things. But you are saying that more radical ideas are needed for partnerships still? Yes, totally. Can I thank all of you for um, this very high-speed assessment of where partnerships can go, and uh, leave the floor to Adrian Monk from the World Economic Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, if I could just ask you to stay in your seats for a few moments. Yasmin mentioned the importance of social entrepreneurship, and we have a very special announcement from Ms. Hilda Schwab from the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship right now. And if I could introduce her, I ask you to welcome her on stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a fascinating discussion. I, I was almost um, desperate till the end. And Yasmin mentioned the word social entrepreneurship, which is really um, very important also for development. Um, for, so I'm very happy to uh, introduce now social entrepreneurs um, to our network. For the past decade, the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship has been highlighting leading social entrepreneurs from around the world and integrating them into various communities of the World Economic Forum. This meeting at the Dead Sea is concentrating on economic growth and job creation, whereas the theme of the upcoming annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos is the great transformation shaping new models. We can all sense there is a great transformation underway which is playing out in different regions in different ways. The Arab world has been an epicenter of this transformation. For most of the past year, it has captivated the world's attention as an entire generation found its voice and demanded to be heard. Many of the demands are universal ones. They are echoed by millions of people around the world. Greater access to jobs and opportunity, an end to vast and growing inequality, a stake in shaping their own future and the future of their country. As we search for new models, and to, to design a more just and equitable society, we have to keep social entrepreneurship in mind. For decades, social entrepreneurs have been on the front lines of improving the lives of, most, of the most powerless among us, the poor, refugees, migrant workers, rural villagers, minorities. Social entrepreneurs are true entrepreneurs, but they put the welfare of others ahead of their own personal gain. They see opportunities where others only see problems. They combine resourcefulness with innovation and create new approaches to seemingly intractable social issues. In short, social entrepreneurs are the new models. This year we are delighted to announce two winners for the Social Entrepreneur of the Year for the Arab World. I would like to ask Sami Saif, Together Association from Egypt to join me on stage.
Sami Saif has always been fascinated with the role that technology can play in solving development challenges. After experimenting with stoves and solar heaters, Sami realized the key challenge he wanted to tackle is pollution. Most rural households are not connected to sanitation systems. As a result, household waste contaminates groundwater, pollutes crops, and spreads disease. Sami designed a sewage plant that can serve an entire village and costs a fraction of a traditional model. His organization, the Together Association, works closely with local communities in the Upper Nile region to install and maintain the systems. The Together Association also provides microloans for households that cannot afford the one-time connection cost. This model is an excellent solution for everyone. It reduces government expenditure and household expenditures. It delivers low-cost potable water to people who otherwise wouldn't have it. Plus, it reduces pollution and frees up water for irrigation. Please join me in congratulating Sami Saif to this award. Kurt Rhodes, Questscope from Jordan. Please join me on stage. Kurt Rhodes has lived in the Middle East for 30 years and has been the driving force behind Questscope for the past two decades. In the 1980s, he left a promising career in academia to provide a second chance for some of the most disaffected, disadvantaged segments of society. Young people, often poor, who drop out of school, but without an education, they had no real job prospects, and without a way to provide for themselves, their social alienation and vulnerability only grew. In partnership with the Jordanian Ministry of Education, Questscope designed the first certificate for 10th grade level. Since 2004, thousands of dropouts have enrolled in Questscope's non-formal education and mentoring programs at 50 centers around the country. Questcope's programs are being expanded to Syria, Yemen, Sudan, northern Iraq, Egypt, and Lebanon. Thanks to this innovative model of collaboration, as has been mentioned before, between government and social enterprise, young people now have a pathway back into formal schooling or vocational training. They have prospects for a real future. Please join me in congratulating Kurt Rhodes to this award, and I thank you, thank you to the panel and to the audience for, to support these initiatives and these fantastic social entrepreneurs and their uh, organizations who uh, improve the lives of so many people. Thank you. <laughs>